While millions of people were engrossed in the incredible movies and shows produced by the industry, both in their homes and cinemas, they remained oblivious to the darkness lurking within. Beyond the glamour and talent that Hollywood exuded, there was an underworld that was very different from what was being shown in the media. From rumors of murders to the mistreatment of actors and numerous atrocities that remained buried and far away from the public eyes, Hollywood was proved to be a dark and chaotic place. Well, let's just say nothing is hidden under the sun because some of these dark and disgusting things that happened in the industry have now been confirmed to be true. The Horrific Fake Film Shoot Anyone who knew about the film studio MGM knew that they were notorious for their dark deeds and would do almost anything to make a scandal disappear and in order to protect their own. They had the money, the power, and the fixers, but when a biographer, David Sten, began to investigate them, he uncovered some secrets that they kept buried for years. One of these was what happened to a 20-year-old dancer named Patricia Douglas at a 1937 MGM party. According to David Sten, MGM did everything in their power to suppress the scandal when it erupted. They even went as far as hiding evidence and doing all they could to silence the victim, but it seems like her innocence screamed louder than their efforts, and soon enough their deeds were brought to the light. Although MGM was successful at burying the story back in the 1930s, David Sten found some evidence that proved that Patricia's story was real. She wasn't the young wannabe star trying to take down a powerful studio. She was a young, vulnerable girl whose innocence was taken away at an MGM party. In the words of the biographer, I managed to find old newspaper coverage, previously unseen photos, damning studio documentation, long-forgotten legal records, privately shot cinematographic evidence hidden in an MGM film vault, and most amazing, Patricia Douglas herself. After 65 years of silence, she was finally able to tell her side of the story. According to Patricia Douglas, that incident completely broke her and turned her life upside down. Before that day, she was living a normal life and was already a part of the entertainment industry. Her love for dancing opened her up to opportunities and at the age of 15, she had already appeared in two classics. Her mother was doing well financially, so she didn't need to work. She only took on a few jobs because she enjoyed it and wanted to keep herself busy. This chestnut-haired lady with porcelain skin would later get a casting call on the 2nd of May, 1937, that changed her life. She had no idea that this call was not what she thought it was, and although she hesitated for a while, she finally said yes. Looking back on that day, Patricia regrets saying yes to that call. In her words, they never mentioned it was for a party, ever. I wouldn't have gone. Oh God, oh God, I wouldn't have gone. Although she and hundreds of other girls were invited for this so-called shoot, they would soon discover that this was no film shoot. It was a party that Louis B. Mayer had, organized to celebrate his salesman for a job well done, but this was no ordinary party. It was going to an alcohol-fueled party where all manner of atrocities would happen. The studio had become the greatest studio in Hollywood, and they bagged distribution deals that will keep them on top for several years. This party is their way of celebrating. Patricia Douglas was one out of the 120 young female dancers that received the casting call. It will surprise you to know that a well-known casting director made these calls so the girls had no idea what was about to happen. They were supposed to be dressed in fitted cowgirl outfits, and as soon as they got to the studio, they were transported to an unknown location for this party. On getting there, Patricia saw over 300 men partying, smoking, and taking all kinds of substances. She didn't see cameras, a crew, or lights. Patricia immediately started to feel uncomfortable, as she had never had any sexual encounter before. She certainly didn't want to be in such a wild party. Sadly, there was no way any of the girls could escape. As the party went on, a particular salesman called David Rose began to admire Patricia. He pretended to want to teach her a dance step, and before she knew it, he and other friends held her down and poured liquor down her throat. Soon enough, Patricia began to feel sick, and when she went outside to get some air, David Ross dragged her to the parking lot and took advantage of her in one of the cars. Interestingly, a parking attendant witnessed the whole thing, but he later denied. Patricia did not keep quiet about what happened. She told her mother about it, and they were able to hire an attorney, but every legal step she took proved futile. No one believed her. One can only imagine how many other girls went through a similar experience that night. 
Patricia, the only person who was bold enough to speak up, was shut down and called a liar by MGM. With their connections, money, and power, they were able to shut the case down. Among the evidence that was later found was a letter from publisher William Randolph Hearst to Louis B. Mayer saying, Shut this down. Make her stop. Do you realize how damaging this is to the whole movie picture industry? With the help of biographer David Sten, she was able to document what happened to her in the documentary titled Girl 27 before she passed on. The Director with Weird Sexual Preferences after several decades of whining, dining, and having wild sexual encounters with celebrities, Scotty Bowers published a book titled Full Service, My Adventures in Hollywood and the Secret Sex Lives of the Stars. Bowers, who was said to have been a go-to guy for setting up all manner of trysts for some of Hollywood's most famous stars, decided to pen down all the escapes that these stars were involved in. While some of his celebrity clients were closeted gays and lesbian, other clients liked things that were weird and freaky. The revelations she made about Charles Lawton left everyone in shock. To the rest of the world, Charles Lawton was a brilliant director. He was a highly respected and influential figure in the film industry. Charles Lawton was an English stage and film actor as well as a director. Truth be told, his talent was recognized early in his career, and he gained fame for his versatility as an actor. He excelled in portraying a wide range of characters from dramatic to comedic roles. Most people who were entertained by his works revered him. Some of his most notable performances include his portrayal of the hunchbacked bell ringer Quasimodo in The Hunchback of Notre Dame in 1939, Captain Bly in Mutiny on the Bounty, in 1935, and his chilling role as the tyrannical barrister in Witness for the Prosecution in 1957. Everyone saw him as a talented man who was laser-focused on his career, but no one knew the secrets he was keeping from the world. In addition to his acting prowess, Lawton also ventured into directing, where he demonstrated a keen eye for storytelling and visual composition. His directorial debut was with the film The Night of the Hunter in 1955, which has since been recognized as a classic of American cinema despite its initial commercial failure. Lawton's impact on the film industry was profound and he was highly respected by his peers. Throughout his career, he received numerous accolades, including an Academy Award for Best Actor for his role in The Private Life of Henry VIII in 1933. Apparently, when he was achieving all these, he was busy behind closed doors doing things that would have shocked his fans. According to Bowers, Charles's secret sexual activities were very different from that of his celebrity friends. He said Charles was into scat proclivities. Bowers revealed that Charles liked it when his sexual partners released on him, and on some occasions, he spread these substances on a sandwich and ate it. Bowers didn't judge this act as he was an open-minded person who believed that people should do whatever they wanted and, in his words, the practice certainly didn't turn me on, but it was patently clear that it was regarded as a normal and acceptable part of sexual activity by its devotees, with Charles Lawton being one of them and Ty Power another. So who was I to judge, to each his own? Who would have thought that this talented man was involved in such sexual acts behind closed doors? Although there were already rumors about what he was involved in, Bauer's book confirmed the rumors and went into detail about what this celebrated director was doing behind closed doors. Charlie Chaplin and Underage Girls He was a highly successful actor who was well-respected in the industry. He was known to have inspired many other actors, but when rumors began to circulate about his preference in women, a lot of people lost respect for him. They simply couldn't believe it. Charlie Chaplin, a towering figure in the world of comedy, mesmerized audiences with his timeless humor and poignant performances on the silver screen. Yet, behind the laughter, his personal life was shrouded in controversy, particularly concerning his romantic entanglements. Soon enough, his secret preferences when it came to women became a subject of both fascination and scrutiny. Truth be told, Chaplin's predilection for marrying significantly younger women was evident throughout his life. His first marriage to 16-year-old Mildred Harris at the age of 29 set a pattern that would repeat itself. 
Despite the considerable age gap, Chaplin seemed drawn to youthful exuberance and innocence. However, his marriages were not devoid of tumult. Harris and Chaplin's union dissolved after two years. It would surprise you to know that he went on to date and marry yet another girl that was younger than him. The pattern persisted with Chaplin's subsequent marriages. At 35, he wed 16-year-old Lita Gray, embarking on a controversial journey that raised eyebrows even in the permissive circles of Hollywood. Their marriage was mired in scandal, with Gray alleging that she was coerced into matrimony due to her pregnancy with Chaplin's child. The marriage ultimately ended in a highly publicized divorce, amplifying the whispers surrounding Chaplin's romantic exploits. People found it difficult to reconcile the man he was in Hollywood to the man that was getting married to underage girls. In 1932, Chaplin found himself entangled with 22-year-old Paulette Goddard, who later revealed that she had initially misrepresented her age, claiming to be 17 when they first met. Despite the revelation, Chaplin pursued the relationship, culminating in marriage when Goddard was 26 and he was 47. Their union endured for six years, characterized by both moments of bliss and strain, emblematic of Chaplin's tumultuous romantic life. However, it was Chaplin's fourth and final marriage that garnered the most attention and controversy. At the age of 54, he wed 18-year-old Una O'Neill, the daughter of esteemed playwright Eugene O'Neill. This union, though met with incredulity and raised eyebrows, endured the test of time, remaining intact until Chaplin's passing. O'Neill's youthfulness and Chaplin's status as a renowned artist of his era magnified the intrigue surrounding their relationship. Chaplin's preference for younger women, coupled with the circumstances of his marriages, fueled speculation and gossip within the industry. While some viewed his actions as indicative of a romantic spirit unbound by societal norms, Others condemned his behavior as exploitative and predatory. The allegations against Chaplin ranged from accusations of manipulation to outright abuse, with his choices seemingly confirming the suspicions harbored by his detractors. There were even rumors that he fled to a different country at a certain point in time in order to avoid certain statutory laws. It seemed like he couldn't help himself, but most people who heard about it were disappointed. They couldn't believe that such a respected man was involved in such. However, despite the condemnation he got from others, he didn't hide the fact that he preferred underage girls. She adopted her own child. Before he became a Hollywood star, it was said that Clark Gable was friends with some questionable people. Perhaps this was why he reached out to a fixer when he discovered that he got a young actress pregnant. What was done after that forever traumatized the child and made her grow up believing that she didn't have parents. If anyone was the epitome of Hollywood masculinity, it was Clark Gable. This charming, leading man-made heart swoon across the globe. He was the kind of guy you'd imagine tipping his hat as he sauntered into a room exuding confidence. And in 1934, he was smack dab in the middle of one heck of a scandal that involved a young actress named Loretta Young. She was a rising starlet with doe eyes and a smile that could light up the silver screen. At just 22, she was already making waves in Hollywood, capturing hearts with her talent and beauty. But little did anyone know she was about to become entangled in a scandalous affair with none other than the dashing Clark Gable. A 34-year-old Gable, already married, diving headfirst into a clandestine romance with the much younger Loretta Young. Their flirtation soon turned into a scandalous affair, and to complicate matters further, Young became pregnant. It was the kind of situation that could spell disaster for both their careers and reputations. Some reports claim that Gable actually forced himself on the actress and that the sexual activities between them were not consensual. When Clark Gable realized how messy the situation was, he reached out to the one person that could fix it, Eddie Mannix a fixer with connections deep in the heart of Hollywood. He wasn't just any friend to Gable, he was the kind of friend who knew how to clean up messes no matter how messy they were. Mannix's solution was as ingenious as it was morally dubious. He orchestrated a plan for Young to fake adopt her own child, effectively concealing the scandal of being an unwed mother. It was a move straight out of the Hollywood playbook. Young, determined to protect her child from judgment, went along with Mannix's plan, confiding only in the inner circles of Hollywood's elite. And so Judy, as she would later be named, grew up believing that Loretta Young adopted her. 
but as Judy grew older, the truth became harder to conceal. It was difficult to ignore the resemblance between Judy and Clark Gable. Soon enough, rumors began to spread, and people started asking questions. Years passed, but secrets have a way of coming to light. On Judy's wedding day, she confronted her mother, demanding to know the truth, and in a moment filled with emotions and regret, Young finally revealed the truth to her daughter. Judy herself later confirmed the truth in her autobiography, Uncommon Knowledge, laying bare the secrets that had been buried for so long. In the end, Eddie Mannix's solution may have spared his friend Clark Gable from immediate scandal, but it couldn't shield him from the consequences of his actions forever. This decision certainly did not spare Judy from the trauma of growing up without parents, why Mary Nolan had 15 abdominal surgeries. If you have ever heard about Hollywood fixers, then the name Eddie Mannix certainly rings a bell. He was the one who was responsible for making most of MGM studio scandals disappear. Whenever something occurred and it could damage the image of the studio, he would go behind the scenes and clean up the mess before the public got to know about it. However, in July 1935, he was not doing someone else's dirty laundry. The scandal was right at his doorstep. His former lover had publicly accused him of maltreating her and ruining her life. He denied all the allegations, but when her friends and family began to speak up about what he did to her, things got a little complicated and he had to find a solution and find it fast. Mary Nolan, Mannix's ex-lover, was a well-known actress in the 1920s. Truth be told, life and career were marked by both successes and personal struggles. Nolan began her career as a Ziegfeld Follies showgirl before transitioning to silent films. She quickly gained attention for her striking beauty and talent on screen. Mary Nolan, initially performing under the name Imogen Robertson in Germany, began her film career there with Verborgene Gluten in 1925, followed by Die Feuer Tanzerin, which garnered her favorable reviews and a contract offer from Universum Film AG. She worked steadily in Germany until 1927, declining offers from Hollywood producers until Joseph M. Schenk of United Artists convinced her to return to the United States. Upon her return, Nolan faced scrutiny from the press and women's groups due to her past scandal, prompting United Artists to suggest a name change to Mary Nolan. She made two films with United Artists before joining Universal Pictures in August 1927, where she received good reviews for her role in Good Morning Judge. In the same year, she was said to have been involved in a relationship with Eddie Mannix, who allegedly used his connections to help boost her career. Mannix was married at the time, so they kept their affair a secret for as long as they could. Nolan's career received a significant boost when she was loaned to Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer for West of Zanzibar in 1928, starring alongside Lon Chaney and Lionel Barrymore. The film was a hit, as was her subsequent loan to MGM for Desert Nights in 1929, opposite John Gilbert, further solidifying her status in Hollywood. However, Mannix and Nolan's affair ended abruptly in 1929. While no one knows for sure why the affair ended, it was said that the actress became an emotional wreck in the following years. Her career began to decline rapidly, and she was said to have displayed erratic behavior on sets. After a long battle with substance abuse and financial problems, her life was in shambles. It was clear that there was a lot of pain buried deep within her, but no one knew what was causing it. It was in 1935 that Mary Nolan decided to open up about what she went through in the hands of Eddie Mannix. Initially, it seemed like a publicity stunt by a desperate actress, but as time went on, people began to see that her claims were not far-fetched from what others had accused Mannix of. According to her, she lived with him in the Ambassador Hotel from the year 1927 to 1931, and they were actively in an affair at the time. As time went on, he began to treat her badly and would even go as far as hitting her and inflicting wounds on her body. She also claimed that he was responsible for the decline of her career and that he allegedly used his influence to ruin her career at a certain point. However, the most shocking part of her story was on the day he attacked her and hit her abdominal area so badly that she had to be hospitalized. The damages he caused were so severe that she had to undergo over 15 surgeries in order to survive. After she sued him, he denied all she had said and claimed that she was using the story to gain fame and sympathy from the public. 
but despite his claims, Mary Nolan had a solid army of witnesses behind her. Her friends and family revealed he maltreated her during the time that they were together. He also allegedly forced her to terminate multiple pregnancies, and there were times when she had to go on set with bruises because of how badly he hit her. As expected, Mannix did everything in his power to bury the story. It was said that he sent a private detective to her house to threaten her, and this was what made her drop the lawsuit. While there was no concrete evidence, anyone who heard about Mannix's heinous crimes knew that there was at least an atom in Mary's story. In the end, Mannix won and was able to bury a story that could have potentially ruined his image and career.